Good morning, and thank you for joining us on Facebook Live this morning. I'm your host, Lisa Leff, and I'm the director of the Holocaust Museum's Jack, Joseph, and Morton Mandel Center for Advanced Holocaust Studies. In this series, we examine Holocaust history and its relevance in our world today, and that's what we'll be doing in today's program as well. In 1938, American journalist Dorothy Thompson wrote, it's a fantastic commentary on the inhumanity of our times that for thousands and thousands of people, a piece of paper with a stamp on it is the difference between life and death. You know, when Thompson wrote that, she recognized specifically the enormous obstacles that European Jews were facing as they tried to escape the Nazi regime. This weekend, we'll be commemorating World Refugee Day. And our program in honor of that is remembering the diplomats who dared. These people had the power to issue indispensable documents that saved lives during the Holocaust. And we'll also be talking about some of the people who benefited from their brave work. I'm so pleased to be joined today by my museum colleague and your regular Facebook Live host, Dr. Edna Friedberg. Hi, Edna. Hey there, good morning, Lisa. To all our viewers out there, welcome. And over the course of today's show, you may have questions. Please send in your questions for Edna by posting them in the comments and we'll try to get to as many of them as we can in today's program live. So Edna, let's start with some context. The Nazis came to power at the beginning of 1933. Why did so many government officials around the world look away from what Germany was doing to the Jews, both legally and often just violence in the streets? So I think one of the key words that you just said was the word legally, um, that much of the persecution and restrictions and targeting of Jews in Germany that happened over the next several years, and it happened gradually, not all at once, um, was handled through the legal system. It was actually the domestic policy of Nazi Germany and very few governments would see it as appropriate or their role even today uh, to interfere with what are seen as internal concerns. Additionally, we don't wanna project our values backwards in time. Uh, the United States, for example, did not see itself as the policeman of the world during this period. And also anti-Semitism, hatred of Jews was much more overt commonplace, socially acceptable during this period. <clears throat> and so uh, the targeting of Jews uh, was not unique also to Germany. Uh, neighboring countries like Hungary had laws like this. Uh, additionally, looking specifically for diplomats posted to Germany, many of them simply did not take Hitler and the Nazis that seriously. They mistakenly thought of him as a sort of cartoonish, buffoon-like character, thought he wouldn't last. And then finally, uh, something I think that is very relatable is governments, foreign service, they had their own concerns at home. I uh, remember this is in the depths of the Great Depression, incredible economic stress, still countries feeling uh, traumatized by the experience of the First World War. And so all of these factors combined led people to just say, you know, not my business, not my responsibility, not my problem, an attitude that I think doesn't necessarily feel that unfamiliar to us. Yes, but of course, with, you know, with terrible consequences. Now, there were exceptions to this among the diplomats. Tell us about the American diplomat, Raymond Geist. Raymond Geist was a career diplomat, member of the U.S. Foreign Service, and he was serving uh, posted to Berlin for the United States for a full decade from 1929 until 1939. Geist's grandparents had themselves been immigrants from Germany came to the United States in the late 19th century. And Geist grew up, he spoke fluent German. He grew up steeped in German language, culture, uh, so social norms. And this mindset, this comfort and ease with German society uh, would come to bear on his work as a diplomat in Berlin and would help him to navigate some of the channels. His boss was the head of the US uh, mission there, George Messersmith. George Messersmith, who we see uh, posted here, would go on to become later a U.S. Assistant Secretary of State and uh, be in very um, critical and strategically important postings. 
Now at this time, and this is something that was surprising to me, I only learned this uh, maybe less than 10 years ago, even though I'm a historian of this period, the United States did not have a refugee policy. I'm gonna say that again. There was no special consideration given to people who were seeking refuge from violence, from uh, persecution at this time. And anyone wanting to enter the United States did so just as part of the regular immigration process. Immigration was very strictly controlled in the United States during the 30s, uh, since an act in 1924 that had set in place a quota system, whereby the number of people who could come to the US from any given country was limited by their country of origin. And the number that was set per country was a ceiling. It wasn't an aspiration. It was a maximum number, a cap of people who could come. And there were intense racial um, prejudices that shaped these limits that were put in place, particularly on the number of immigrants who could come from Southern Europe, on Jews, from Eastern Europe, on people from Asian countries. So what does this have to do with Raymond Geist? One of the main responsibilities that Raymond Geist had in Berlin was to administer America's annual German immigration quota. And of course, as the situation became increasingly desperate for Jews in Germany, he became one of the most powerful men um, in a life and death way. Uh, let's hear from historian Richard Brightman, who will describe how Raymond Geist uh, became that rare diplomat who recognized the threat that Hitler and the Nazi regime po posed um, after their ascent to power. I think Geist recognized the threat from the Nazis from the very beginning. And certainly after Hitler came to power in 1933, Geist saw the results of Nazism from the beginning with Jews being attacked on the streets for no reason, with Jews being seized and thrown into informal prisons or early concentration camps. Geist really began to interact with uh, German police and with Nazi party officials at a very early stage. And he could see what they were like. And he could see the dangers. And by 1934, uh, he was writing to Messersmith and then he was writing to other uh, State Department officials in Washington that if Hitler succeeded and made Germany strong again, Nazi Germany would be a threat to all of Western civilization. And uh, they would likely launch a war that would seize all of Europe and pose a horrendous problem for the United States. This was really very, very early and his warnings were very, very stark. Before we go on, I want to acknowledge our viewers. A number of you are watching from around the world, uh, from Mexico, from Vancouver, uh, from Canada, from Israel, from Berlin and all the way from India. We've also got people watching from across the United States. So hello to those of you watching in Vermilion, Ohio, from Aurora, Illinois, from Minnesota, from Oregon, and from Chesterfield, Virginia. And as I said earlier, if you have questions for Edna, please type them in the comments and we'll try to get to them. Um, so let's go back to Geist. Um, you know, from what Dr. Brightman's saying, Geist was a rule follower working from within the bureaucracy itself, but he still had a tremendous impact. Um, tell us about what uh, he was able to do for one of the most famous people who was seeking refuge in the United States, and that's Albert Einstein. So Albert Einstein, instantly recognizable here, I'd venture to say probably still the most recognizable and famous scientist of, of all time. Um, but by late 1932, Einstein, he was already very prominent. He had won the Nobel Prize, and he was also the target of anti-Semitic attacks in Germany. He was a Jewish man, and he was an outspoken critic of the Nazis. Now, the Nazis were not yet a governing power, but they were increasingly threatening. Uh, there was street violence, and with German politics becoming more chaotic, Einstein and his wife Elsa applied for visitors visas to come to the United States. They felt that they were in a precarious position. So it was, as I mentioned, up to Geist to decide whether to grant these visas. And initially he went by the book. 
He didn't give the Einsteins any special treatment and he interviewed them as he would any other person seeking admittance to the US. But this lack of VIP treatment uh, left Einstein feeling so insulted that apparently he actually walked out of the interview before it was done, um, complaining about their treatment, making a stink in the press. And Geist and his boss, Messer Smith, uh, were able to expedite these visas and they had them ready very quickly. The Einsteins left Germany uh, just in time in uh, December 1932. And here we're actually seeing some film footage from a couple years earlier. This was not his first trip to the US, um, but they left one month before Hitler assumed office. I've got a question for you from the audience as we watch this. Um, were there laws that specifically prohibited people from helping the Jewish population? This is coming from Amber. Well, during the course of the Holocaust, those kinds of, of laws or prohibitions varied greatly from country to country. And uh, during the war, the penalties were much harsher. But in the period of the 1930s, a diplomat like Geist um, could offer sympathetic or compassionate treatment to someone who was applying for safe haven uh, without any fear of repercussions, as long as it was not directly against his own government's policy. And later we'll be talking about a diplomat who did uh, buck his own government policy. And of course, as we said, Geist was always very careful to follow his own government's policy. But how did he manage the challenging terrain in Germany itself? Um, so Geist, as I mentioned, was very familiar with German culture and he used this to his advantage. He would negotiate directly with Nazi officials, at times was able to even negotiate, I believe, um, prisoner releases. And he really felt though that the system could work for him rather than making a public stink um, that he was going to maneuver within the constraints and limitations from the U.S. State Department and see if he could help people by using the quotas um, to maximize them. I think we have another clip uh, from Richard Brightman describing the approach that Geist advocated uh, during this period. His strategy was not to have President Roosevelt or anyone else denounce Hitler and Nazi Germany publicly. He said in one um, now um, striking uh, document, he said, look, no condemnation of Nazi Germany can be too strong under the circumstances. But if you're going to criticize them publicly, then let's go all the way and declare war on Germany and do what we can to get rid of this horrible regime. If you're not willing to do that or not ready to do that, and certainly nobody in the United States was ready to do that politically, then please refrain from open criticism and let me see what I can do privately and let's let immigration continue. I understand that Geis also worked to help people living outside of Germany. Tell us how he helped bring 50 Jewish children from Vienna to safety in the US. I will, but I'm gonna pause for a second just to say something about the way that Geist used the um, immigration numbers, if I could, because I think there's something really instructive to us today in the, the tension that Geist embodied, that it can be really emotionally appealing and feel powerful to you know, throw a grenade, not literally, but to protest, to, to make noise, to want there to be a big rupture, but that in fact, sometimes the most effective course of action can be taken quietly behind the scenes and in working the system. And Geist really embodied that. He recognized the tragedy that the quotas that I mentioned earlier were ceilings, not goals, were going unfilled. In the five years between 1933 and 1938, some 80,000 slots of the German quota went unused. Those were Jews or anyone, a political opponent who could have escaped the Nazi regime but were denied entry. And Geist saw that as a tragedy and it was under his oversight in 1938 to 39 that for the first time the German quota was filled with more than 27,000 slots. So I really just wanted to point to the fact that he saw himself as doing the right thing by working quietly, that that was the way he could be most effective. 
Absolutely. You know, we've got a we've got a comment that's just come in that I think is really um, really interesting from Angie. She writes, "It seems odd that so much was left to the discretion to the discretion of individual consular officials or diplomats." And I think that's you know that's a really interesting point here that even within following the rules, being a bureaucrat does not make you a robot, um, that there is room for interpretation and for pushing um, for a different interpretation of the rules than was the norm at that time. Absolutely, Angie. And it's something that we see even in examining cases of, of German officials and even Nazi officials, that there was a huge variation in the ways that people carried out orders, interpreted law, and that human agency and discretion played a very, very big role, often the difference between life and death for people. Now, Lisa, I will go to your question. You asked about the children from Vienna. Um, so the hurdles to immigrate to America, we need to remember were high. It's not just these quota numbers, um, but as I had mentioned, the United States was in the depths of the Great Depression, unemployment, and we're seeing here a, a line for a, a soup kitchen in Chicago in the 1930s. Um, people were quite literally hungry in America, and there was, rightly or wrongly, uh, a fear that immigrants might take jobs that otherwise would go to native-born Americans. Um, there were also other hurdles, um, medical exams, and a requirement to prove that the individual who wanted to emigrate would not become an, uh, an economic burden on the system. So recognizing this reality and the, the swirl of concerns and fears that many Americans had, Geist advised German Jewish organizations that they might have a better chance of getting unaccompanied children into the United States, kids traveling without their parents uh, because the children would not be perceived as uh, a threat. They would not be on the job market anytime soon. So in March, 1938, Germany uh, annexed Austria, its neighbor, as part of an event we now call the Anschluss. And Geist learned around this period of an American Jewish businessman named Gilbert Krauss uh, from the city of Philadelphia, who along with his wife, Eleanor, had hatched a plan to try to bring 50 Jewish children from Vienna, the Austrian capital, to the United States. Uh, Gilbert and Eleanor Krauss worked their contacts, talk to their friends to arrange to have families that would be um, willing and able to foster these children into the United States. So ensure that they would not need government assistance. And this is where Geist got really creative. He used his knowledge, his intimate knowledge of the quota and visa system to include the 50 Austrian children in the German immigration quota because now technically Austria was part of Germany. He also used something called dead numbers. These were visas that had previously been granted to other applicants, uh, other German Jewish refugees, who for whatever reason could not use them. They had gotten sick, maybe someone had died, the timing wasn't right, and he used these unfilled German quota numbers for these children to arrive legally into the United States. Now we need to think about the fact that each of these 50 kids was someone's cherished daughter or son. Uh, one of them was a little girl named Erica Tamar, and we are seeing her passport here, her identity card, you know, a little kid. Uh, her parents are taking a leap of faith to send her off to strangers. Um, and she was able to depart the U.S. on a boat. We're seeing these um, Krauss rescue children on the boat without their parents um, coming to the United States. Uh, they eventually arrived in the U.S. in the spring of 1939. Uh, hoping to be reunited someday with their parents, but many of them were never reunited with their families and instead were orphaned after they themselves found safety. But they did, they went on to have productive lives, families of their own, and it's thanks not only to Gilbert and Eleanor Krauss, but to the creativity of Raymond Geist, American diplomat. You know, one of the things that's so interesting about the story that you're telling us about the Krauses is that behind every rescuer, we often see other rescuers. There's a whole network working together. Um, let's turn now to another example, Edna, the story of a businessman who saved thousands of lives with what began as an honorary diplomatic title. Who was George Mandel? So this is one of my favorite stories, and I uh, rest here on the shoulders of a, a number of colleagues who spent years researching this man. George Mandel was a Hungarian-Romanian, border switched at this time, Hungarian-Jewish um, businessman, 
uh, who was working uh, as a manufacturer and a financier near Budapest, the Hungarian capital in the 1930s. George Mandel, while he was there, met a local diplomat from El Salvador, pictured here, Colonel Jose Arturo Castellanos, who was the consul general from El Salvador, a man who came from a, a military family and also a career diplomat from El Salvador. Now, a critical part of diplomacy is building relationships locally, getting to know people, um, making use of their contacts. And although that is initially how Castellanos and Mandel met, they struck up a genuine friendship. Uh, we see here a photograph of Castellanos on the far left at some kind of uh, dinner party or event um, with on the right, uh, George Mandel and his wife, Irene. So Hungary, as I mentioned earlier in the 1930s was really not a comfortable place uh, to be Jewish. Uh, in the late 1930s, although Hungary was not um, occupied, this was not wartime yet, uh, they still had their own domestic harsh anti-Jewish laws in place. Life was very stressful. And Castellanos sought to take his friend Mandel under his wing. He provided him with a Salvadoran passport and in 1939 actually appointed him as an honorary consul of El Salvador for the countries of Romania, Czechoslovakia, and Hungary. This sort of title, although it might sound a little jarring to us, it was not unusual in the diplomatic world and it's still given today. Some people who live near uh, a regional consulate may know that smaller countries will give especially prominent business people some kind of um, adjunct title at their consulate. Uh, Castellanos was then transferred. He was posted to Geneva in neutral Switzerland. And at that point, he brought his friend physically to safety. He brought George Mandel to Geneva and actually gave him a job, creating a new title for him of first secretary at the consulate in order to provide extra protection. At this point, Mandel changed his name to Mandel Mantello uh, to try to give his name more of a kind of Spanish or Italian almost sounding flair. And of course, it sounds like getting this title was itself a form of rescue. But then something happens next, right? How did Mantello go from being a rescued person to becoming a rescuer himself? So Mantello's appointment and his position gave him some prominence and um, a reputation that maybe he had influence and could help. And while he was in Geneva, Mantello was approached by representatives from an Orthodox Jewish group known as the Aguda or Agudat Yisrael, who came to Mantello hoping that he might be able to help them purchase protective documents, uh, the kinds of papers that Geist was issuing, um, either documents that would allow them to escape or documents that might allow Jews to assume false identities that would disguise their Jewishness. Mantello was actually upset by this request, uh, not, not that the people needed these documents, he understood all too well the desperate straits in which they found themselves, but to hear or to realize that other diplomats might be profiting from the desperation of people um, like his family members. Uh, Mantello said that he instead, he would not only give them documents, he would not help them purchase any, um, but instead he was going to do something much more audacious. And with the blessing of Castellanos, Mantello began manufacturing papers that certified European Jews as citizens of El Salvador, uh, looking to offer a kind of paper umbrella or shelter to Jews who were at imminent risk. Now, I wanna be clear, these were genuine documents in that they were authentically, truly issued by a government agency, by the consulate of El Salvador, but the information in them was false. They were used to protect people who had never been to El Salvador, almost surely did not even speak Spanish, uh, but word spread of this project and more people began to approach Mantello, not only with document requests for themselves, but with the names of their family members, their friends, names of entire um, school classes. Mantello eventually created hundreds of these documents and then thousands of them, hiring college students to help him keep the paper flowing. And these were delivered to every country across Europe occupied by the Germans, whether by regular Swiss mail, hand delivered, some even were sent by diplomatic pouch. Edna, as you're telling us about the breadth of the operation, I wanna acknowledge the breadth of our viewership today. We've got people watching from Denmark, from Argentina, from Bolivia, from Kenya. 
Um, so let's continue with this theme of um, talking about the breadth of the operation. Can we look at some examples that illustrate it? So there's a pretty standard format for these certificates. Um, often photographs up in the right-hand corner of the people that they describe. Um, we'll uh, zoom in here and we can see. So the upper left-hand corner, these are printed out on official uh, El Salvador our Salvadoran Consulate General letterhead um, with photographs, stamps on them, they're typed and they show this particular document belonged to French Jews named Vivette and Julien Samuel. Uh, they were themselves rescuers. Um, the body of the document is written in French because it's in uh, Switzerland and it includes both their names as well as the name of their daughter, Francoise. And on the bottom again, more stamps, a mailing address for them, and the signature of George Mantello. So on its surface, kind of a strange document, um, you know, a mixture of languages and cultures. Uh, you may have noticed that these are extraordinarily good quality, this document, it's not at all crumpled, and that's because this is original. What happened was Mantello kept the originals of the certificates that he produced and sent a photostat, a kind of early copy, to the recipients. And about 2,000 of these documents actually uh, were stored in a suitcase forgotten for many decades in Geneva in someone's basement, and then later donated to our museum. It's so fascinating to think about the post history of these documents and, and the reasons why we have them. The piece of paper we were looking at, also it strikes me, it just, it represents so much more than just the two people on it, right, whose names are on it. Tell us more about them. Who were these people, Vivette and Julien Samuel? So this ties into the, exactly the phenomenon that you mentioned earlier, the ideas that there were networks of rescuers. We see here a picture of uh, Vivette and Julien Samuel on the day of their wedding, um, appropriately surrounded by children because they were administrators for a critical organization uh, working in occupied France. They were administrators for the Children's Aid Society the Oeuvre de Secours aux Enfants in France, or OSE, O-S-E. And this was a group that protected well over 1,000 Jewish children in France, uh, saved them from deportation, at times even negotiated their release from um, French-run transit or internment camps. They ran 14 children's homes throughout France um, in order to shield children from direct German custody and shield them from deportation. Now, Vivette and Julian Samuel would never have had an opportunity to meet George Mantello, but someone who knew of them heard of Mantello's effort and made a request for a protective, uh, protective um, certificate for them in order to shield them. But their work was very dangerous. The Gestapo raided the children's homes on many occasions. Some of the children and their adult caregivers were arrested and sent to killing centers in Eastern Europe. Um, and so by protecting Julien and Vivette Samuels, you were actually protecting a much, much larger, larger uh, body of safety for many, many more people. And that is the importance of this kind of certificate. It represents more than just the faces pictured directly there. Yeah, and it's so beautiful and telling that their wedding photo is surrounded by the children of the home that they were working in and those children that they were helping to rescue. I wanna give a quick shout out to our friends from the Georgia Commission of the Holocaust. Welcome. So, you know, to, to think about the contrast in the two cases we've looked at so far, Geist was helping Jews escape <clears throat> Nazi Europe, but Mantello was never intending for his documents to actually provide safe passage to El Salvador. His certificate holders were sometimes still deported to camps even, um, but there they received better treatment. The next certificate we're gonna look at was actually delivered to a family in Westerbork camp, a transit camp, um, where Jews from the Netherlands were held before they were sent off to concentration camps or killing centers. And can you tell us about the Joseph family? So the Joseph family and the photograph that we just saw there is of an arrival of Dutch Jews who had been uh, arrested and sent to Westerbork. Um, the Joseph family actually is the perfect example of the kind of discretion we talked about earlier. The Mantello citizenship papers that certified that people were um, 
protected by their status as Salvadoran citizens was really kind of an act of hope, um, of optimism. Now this very plain looking document uh, certifies as Salvadoran citizens, um, two parents and uh, their two children, German Jews who actually found themselves, and we can see here zoomed in on the bottom left, their certificate was actually sent to them at Westerbork. So it's tempting to think about concentration camps during the Holocaust as black holes and that there was no information going in and out of them, but someone knew that the Joseph family was imprisoned there and sent them the certificate, which actually would uh, come to save, save their lives. Uh, what happened was when the Joseph family was recognized as Salvadoran uh, citizens, and we know this is true because we have records of German documents, German camp records listing them as Salvadoran, they were then sent to the Bergen-Belsen concentration camp and put into a special kind of uh, protective area for different special status prisoners. They were held there, uh, they received better food than other prisoners in the camp. They were allowed to continue to wear their own clothing rather than inmate uniforms. And they were kept there as bargaining chips. And late in the war, as Germany could feel that, um, German officials could feel that they were going to lose, the four members of the Joseph family were part of a prisoner exchange. They were swapped for 150 uh, German POWs in exchange for these Bergen-Belsen um, prisoners. And we can follow the paper trail. It shows that they were sent from there to a refugee camp in what is now the Congo and eventually found their way um, to safety in Palestine, later Israel. Uh, their son, Joachim, and we're seeing here his teenage identification card after he had arrived um, in um, British Palestine, um, went on to become a renowned climate scientist uh, who specialized in um, dust storms and actually contributed to a mission of one of the space shuttles. So I mention this um, not just as a side detail, but to show the reminder to us that every life that was saved had the potential to make incredible, incredible contributions to the world. And we will never be able to calculate or measure um, what was lost through all the lives. But all of this just kind of takes us back to the comment you mentioned earlier about the discretion of individual officials. One might say, who in the world would imagine that a German official would honor or recognize such an improbable certificate saying that a German Jew or a Dutch Jew or a Hungarian Jew was Salvadoran, but it mattered. It could matter. And in this case, it made all of the difference. And such a wide impact, right? All over Nazi-occupied Europe and for two years. Let's go back to Castellanos for a second. Was he putting his career at risk? by allowing this operation to, um, to work out of his consulate? Absolutely. Castellanos uh, had, in fact, because he was so disturbed by what he saw happening to Jews uh, in Europe and the danger that they were in, he had written directly to his superiors, to the foreign minister of El Salvador in 1939, to sound the alarm, to ask if he could uh, be given permission to grant more visas to allow Jews to emigrate to El Salvador, and he was told no. Um, so he went against his orders. He didn't allow uh, direct immigration visas, and actually that probably, again, talking about working the system, would have um, attracted attention sooner. But he knew what his friend Mantello was doing. He gave him his blessing. He let him make these documents on his letterhead out of his office, and he knowingly put his official capacity, his family's economic stability, at risk. Um, later, very later, much later, in May 1944, a new president came into power in El Salvador and allied itself with the Western allies against um, the Axis alliance. And Castellanos, at this point, no longer had to buck his government. But I want to be clear, this was never an official government program. It began, began as a rogue operation between two friends. And through the compassion and audacity of Castellanos, thousands of visas um, were issued, thousands of certificates were issued to help Jews. Castellanos returned to El Salvador at the end of the war, retired about a decade later. And from what I've read, he never talked about what he had done as a rescuer. I don't think that he thought of himself that way and that his own daughter didn't even learn about it until many decades later when she read about it in the newspaper. So he did not see himself as a hero. Which is, you know, we know typical of so many brave rescuers is that they're modest about their work. 
Um, we've got a beautiful comment uh, that I want to read from the Castaneda family watching from El Salvador. They write, um, proud to be Salvadoran and to know someone from our small country made a difference. Um, thank you so much for watching and for your comment. Uh, we've also got a question from Teresa. Did Yad Vashem recognize Mandel or Castellanos? Yes, thank you for that, Teresa. And for those who are less familiar, Yad Vashem is the uh, official Israeli Holocaust Memorial. They have a, a program there called Righteous Among the Nations, where they recognize non-Jewish rescuers who put themselves at risk in order to save lives during the Holocaust. Castellanos was recognized by Yad Vashem. He is the only Salvadoran national to have received this designation. I believe he received it in 2011 and justly, justly deserved. Um, Mantello did not because the program is for non-Jews who help Jews. And so that's another reason that I'm always eager to shine a light on this program is that often Jewish rescuers um, are neglected or people don't even expect to, to hear about them because they mistakenly assume that there was nothing that Jews could do to help other Jews. But Mantello uh, made a difference in thousands and thousands of lives. Yeah, and it's one of the saddest ironies of the Mandel Mantello story that for all the people that he helped to keep alive, he wasn't in fact able to save some of the people closest to him. Yeah, it was a, an intense tragedy for him. Um, Mantello's son Enrico was also brought to safety in Geneva by Castellanos. Um, Mantello's wife remained behind to care for her elderly parents and Mantello's own parents and extended family, aunts, uncles, and cousins had stayed behind in Hungary. Um, this reminds us of a paradox of the Holocaust because Hungary was an ally of Nazi Germany in a, a, a strange irony, um, Hungarian Jews were kind of protected. They did, were among the last to come under direct German control and this actually shielded many of them from deportation. This all changed in March 1944 when Germany violated that alliance and invaded Hungary. And at that moment, uh, Mantello realized that his own parents and other loved ones were at risk, uh, were in imminent dangers. He, danger. He created citizenship documents for his parents and wanting to take no chances, he asked a sympathetic Romanian diplomat, so again, uh, diplomats being able to do things others could not, to hand deliver them directly to his parents in his hometown of Bistrita. The diplomat made it there, but unfortunately he was too late. Uh, he learned uh, that just days earlier, Mantello's parents had been deported, uh, we now know, to Auschwitz, uh, where they were murdered in the gas chambers. So despite all of the people that Mantello was able to help, he was not able to save his own parents. Um, but he did have the uh, ambition and optimism and ingenuity to create one of the largest rescue attempts in the course of the Holocaust. I believe the most far flung. I don't know of any other rescue operation that spanned the number of countries that Mantello's citizenship papers did. And uh, just to give a sense of the effectiveness, they really, really worked. When researchers at the Holocaust Museum have cross-checked names of Mantello certificate holders against kind of camp records and death records, just as an example, 70% of Dutch Jews died. That was the mortality rate during the Holocaust. Of Dutch Mantello certificate holders that we've been able to trace, 72% of them survived. So these really, really worked. Wow, and it's so sad that you know his own family was not among those he was able to save. We've really seen a range of stories today of diplomats who acted um, and one of the things that we see is a kind of courage, a selfless courage, and also, you know, beneath their stories, the fact that no rescuer could really act alone. What a valuable lesson. It's absolutely true, and it shows that people who may have seemingly mundane jobs or that we might think of them as bureaucrats or paper pushers, in fact, can have uh, intense influence and power, and that remains true to, to this day um, in crisis zones and in places that can function as safe havens. And we see through the people of Geist, Mantello, um, Castellanos, and others with whom they worked, 
that many of them saw the best way that they could be effective was to work within restrictive systems, not to blow them up, not to make a stink, but to work the system to their advantage and apply it for humanitarian purposes. And we can see the impact that tens of thousands of people and their uh, descendants are alive today thanks to the uh, courage and compassion of these of these diplomats today. So I find them very, very inspiring and I hope that our viewers will too. I certainly do as well. And, and another thing that I think we really saw today is, um, you know, we really busted a myth here, Edna, um, showing that Jews were not, never were passive actors during the Holocaust. Some of them were involved, um, the Samuels and Mandel Mantello, some of them were operating huge rescue networks, self-rescue, right? Um, and that they were able to act even in the scariest of times when they themselves were threatened. Mandel's story emphasizes that you should never give up because you can really have an impact even when you yourself are at risk. Thank you so much, Edna, for sharing your expertise with us. And thank you. thank you to our viewers. I wanna invite all of you to join us for our next program, which will be on Wednesday, June 30th at 9.30 a.m. Eastern time. We'll be commemorating Pride Month with the story of two gay members of a Dutch resistance group who bombed a government building to protect the identities of Jews and resistance fighters. So please tune in. Thank you for watching and be well.